Hi, I am Renato Ambrosio from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. I'm very sorry for not being with you. It's a true honor and a great pleasure to participate in this uh, 36th International Congress of the Hellenic Society of Intraocular Implant and Refractive Surgery. My first talk is on custom refractive surgery beyond 2020, today in 2022. These are my financial disclosures. I work with many companies, but I must say that my most important disclosure is to help my patient the best way as possible as a physician, as an ophthalmologist, and as a refractive surgeon. Uh, I come here with a first idea that we are here to, to improve ourselves, to optimize ourselves. And the three paths for failure, this is not from ancient Greek, which I love, but this is from Beda. Uh, it's not to teach what you know, not to practice what you taught, and not to be humble to ask what you ignore. So the opposite of that is what we need to do for success. We need to teach, to share, we need to practice, we need to give the advice and also the example. And also, of course, we have to be open to learn always. When you think about refractive surgery, it's very much related to that. Refractive surgery was introduced in Brazil by uh, my father's group in the same hospital that I was born. And this was in the early 80s. And this was the first book, Refractive Surgery. And we have two big colleagues that he had, Dr. Ricardo Guimarães and Carlos Andrade. And since then, we have evolved. And we must say beyond 2020, because 2020 was an emblematic year for us, and 2020 is what we consider as the normal vision, uh, 1.0, log mar zero. But refractive surgery has to be redefined. We will talk about that. Multimodal imaging and the options for customization, that's the basic of this talk. And of course, we have the surgical options on the cornea, LASIK, SMILE, and TRK, but refractive surgery goes really beyond, not over refractive surgery on the cornea. We have intraocular surgery, we have fake KOLs, and of course, refractive cataract surgery. And eventually we can use, actually very importantly, we can use the technology from refractive surgery for therapeutic cases. Uh, the most common example is patients with keratoconus. So refractive surgery is a subspecialty of ophthalmology is being recognized as that, in which we talk about, we study the elective procedures that aim for refractive correction. The goal is not only to reduce refractive correction uh, and refractive need, but patient satisfaction because of quality of vision and improving the quality of life. But we have definitely evolved and we have to evolve based on technology, knowledge to use technology and patient care. And this includes education to the patient, not seducing the patient to surgery, but explaining the odds, the options, and the risk, benefit, and limitations for surgery. But the most important evolution, I think, is in the mindset to change refractive surgery, not as a subspecialty, but a super specialty of medicine, in which ophthalmology is, of course, a prerequisite. The refractive surgery mindset, though, resonates very well with the World College of Refractive Surgeon Visual Scientists. Uh, many uh, colleagues around the world, including Guy Kizirian, Arthur Cummings, uh, Dr. Dan Dury, uh, Dan Reinstein, and many others are uh, related to this movement to make refractive surgery as a new specialty in medicine. And I remember one of my colleagues that visited me from Portugal last year, he asked me, where did I learn uh, the procedure that was just done? I, I don't remember exactly which procedure, but it was probably something related to corneal intracor uh, intracorneal ring segment and cross-linking. And if I learned that in my fellowship, or in my residency. Uh, actually, it was not related to anything I did during this time, but at this time, I learned the foundations. And basically, we learn how to learn, to continue to learn towards the best versions of ourselves. Learn to always learn. The ways to learn how to teach and to serve, to be taught and to teach, to understand and optimize, to acknowledge and flourish. That was something that I wrote a couple of weeks after that idea that we discussed. So it's very related to what we're talking today. We're talking about customization. Customization is to modify in consideration of the particular individual tasks that the patient has. And customization 
is a very interesting concept that is very much related to laser vision correction. And custom refractive surgery is definitely related to customized ablation. This is a very classic from the physics time, which I uh, consulted for physics for many years. And unfortunately, this technology did not evolve after uh, uh, the, the, this is the VSS VRR, very spot size and very re 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 repetition rate, so that you reduce the blur from the point spread function to this uh, Aries disk, which is a, a point spread function of a diffraction limited uh, uh, system, which is definitely refractive custom ablation. But it's not only that, it's not only customized ablation. It's related to the diagnostics that we have to understand the patient, to understand what we have in terms of uh, a patient and how to deal with the complications, to prevent the complications, to optimize the result. So the what's that we have for questioning when we examine a patient with a diagnostic platform is to optimize and customize planning. And it, it's part of the customization to decide if you're doing surgery on the cornea, if the patient is a better candidate for fake IOL, or if the patient is best suited for refractive cataract surgery. We have to understand if the patient needs a therapeutic procedure that we are going to use refractive technology. It's very important when we talk about uh, the goals of a patient that's a therapeutic procedure, the patient needs to improve the corrected vision and elective refractive surgery aims to improve uncorrected vision. So it's very important to set the expectations and the goals so that we define what is success. Of course, when you do surgery on the cornea, we have to decide what's the best procedure for the patient, PRK, advanced surgical ablation. We have LASIK, we have SMILE, excellent procedures. All of those still are part of my armamentarium and we can decide cases for each of these procedures. Of course, we want to prevent complications and prevent the complications that we talk about is progressive ectasia, of course, but it's the most feared complication, but it's not the most common. The most common complications, tear dysfunction, ocular pain is also related to uh, this, but it's more uh, rare to have a patient with pain. But if we get the understanding of what can be a risk factor for those complications, including epithelization and smile, including quality of vision related symptoms and other complications, we can learn from the diagnostics that start from the anamnesis, slit lamp, central corneal thickness, placido disc topography, ocular surface imaging, 3D tomography with the sign fluke. And of course, we have whole eye wavefront data that is related to the customization, but it goes beyond. We have custom topo guided. We have today custom uh, ray tracing that would also use axial length along with corneal topography and whole eye wave from data. We have segmental tomography, the epithelial thickness data. We have uh, corneal biomechanics. We have understanding of the cells. And eventually, more and more, we will see in the future osmolarity, uh, molecular biology, and genetics as part of our armamentarium. So, those are the hows. So we can decide if the patient is the best candidate for surface ablation or for LASIK. Uh, eventually, if you're still doing keratom LASIK, if the patient has a cornea and a level of correction that still can be corrected with LASIK in a safe, safe profile for long-term stability. Of course, SMILE has a lower biomechanical impact than LASIK, but not lower than, than, than PRK or surface ablation. And if you have very good options for phakic IOLs with the ICL, with the icrel phakic, and still with the interior chamber artisan lens. Interestingly, we can talk about refractive cataract surgery. And the concept is that the lens dysfunction syndrome in the perspective review that we propose that we have stages, the early presbyopic, which is something around what I have uh, uh, up to 50 something, 50 plus, that you have some near vision need. And then you have a severe loss of accommodation that you need more than 2.25, two and a half diopters of ad. And then you have mild cataract. And here you can you don't have a, a, a perfect limbus here. You have like a, a blur between stage two and three. And then we need to have objective analysis, the loss of quality of vision, the need for documentation. And when you get this, a loss of high contrast vision is easier to understand when you need cataract surgery. Interestingly, we have sign fluke data and we have other technologies like whole eye wave from data integrated to 
corner topography like the eye trace, the DLS function, and we can correlate all of that with the diagnosis and, uh, and, the, and the level of energy that you need, for example, for removing the cataract with the fake ossification. So refractive cataract surgeon lenses function has been nicely reviewed recently in a very nice chat in the cataractcoach.com, Dr. Uday and Guy Kazirian, very nice concept that we have always to remember Dan Dury, his perspective, understanding on how to talk to the patient and to educate the patient about this. Going to the cornea, we have sometimes occult basement membrane dystrophy, and we can detect that based on technology. And this is going to be related to how easy it is. I do surface ablation with epithelial thickness, and I use the OCT to, to help me with the PRK, the PTK for epithelial thickness. And in this case, is I prefer to do the epithelorexis. And sometimes this is going to help me to understand when this is not a keratoconus. This is a more obvious case that you have the, 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 the classic met dot fingerprint signs and you see how easy it is to detect. And this is not a case of PRK for keratoconus. You see the steep cornea without tomographic, a huge tomographic change, but you see the epithelial thickness here in the basement membrane. So it's a very important way of, of looking at the characterization. Another example on a case here that has mild keratoconus, this patient will be a 34 years old physiotherapist uh, that she does not tolerate the glasses and contact lenses. She was stable for more than three years as her current glasses uh, could be seen. And she had high astigmatism, don't, didn't have 20-20 best correct vision. You see topography here, the topometric maps from shine flu, you have abnormalities detected. And if you change the scale first, here's the uh, Steve Kleiss 1.5 diopter scale. This is the classic ICs half a diopter scale. And this is 0.25. And this is the Ambrosia 2 scale. So all these scales would show the same thing. You have a irregular cornea, irregular astigmatism. So the patient uh, uh, would be considered as a uh, uh, topo tomographic evaluation. Importantly, it would show uh, a D that is higher than 1.6 in both eyes. And the topometric map will be abnormal in the right eye and you have IHD abnormal in the left eye. But considering the age, and considering the level of correction, and here we also have epithelial thickness. And this time I was start, started do, I was already doing cardiobiomechanical mechanical analysis with the Scheinfug dynamic system with the Corvus. We didn't have the CBI, but this is a retrospective calculation of the CBI from the data that I had from this time. So the diagnostic was the patient had uh, mild keratoconus and with aqua surface. Uh, uh, optimization advised against eye rubbing, we decided to go for safe, safe uh, PRK, surface ablation topo guided. And didn't, at that time, we didn't even have the concept of contura, but the need for follow up and possible indication of cross linking was advised for the patient, but we did not do cross linking at that time, as I don't routinely do cross linking as a prophylactic procedure. I prefer to do it as a therapeutic procedure when we have progressive ectasia. Interestingly, the, the patient did very well. This is the, the, the Allegretto 400 hertz uh, profile of the ablation, and the patient did very well. So about 18 months after surgery, she comes back and she asked me, doctor, I'm doing well, and Jim's coming here to see if I need cross-linking. And she was incorrect in 2025 and 2020. She gained vision. Uh, this is correct vision, and you see stability based on topometric maps and shine, and shine fluid tomography front and back surface in both eyes. The last follow-up was September 2020, and she was still very stable. And CBI post LVC was 003 and 004. This is a very nice concept by Hitardo Vinciguera. Another situation is when a patient has a cornea and a level of correction that does not afford cornea refractive surgery, and this patient was advised to go for fake KOL. You have to go for anterior chamber evaluation. And she did very well with icrial uh in both eyes. And you see the change in uh, anterior chamber depth. And also therapeutic bioptics is an option. It is a patient that had mild keratoconus. We place a ring first. We regularize the coin, improve distance correct vision. And based on the level of distance correct vision and high uh, emetropia, we can put a 
spherical or toric spherical uh, fake ki well for refractive proposals. So thinking about customization beyond 2020, we have to think about the mindset of the refractive surgeon, humanized medicine, patient education, the need for understanding the patient's needs, individual characteristics, the patient uh, presbyopia, the early cataract, multimodal image is a must, and we need to interpret that in the concept of the I2I I squared, which is applied artificial intelligence and the philosophy ancient intelligence, which we'll talk about later, and for individualized medicine, talking to the patient and doing the best in the Hippocratical corpus and the medical mission to heal a few times, relieve often, and always comfort the patient. So thank you very much for kind of attention. And I'm really, really sorry for not being with you, but it's an honor to participate in your meeting. Thank you.